Uh, we're excited to, to, to uh, have President Holland speak to you as the Cal students, and this is the Mastermind Lecture Series. Um, very excited, and thank you to Kirk Young for the invitation. Um, I, I rarely get a chance to introduce my boss, uh, President Holland, and I'll make this short. Uh, he's he's going to be actually talking about it a little bit when he came on, on board as the president of this institution, but uh, he will never share kind of his background and credentials, um, but I will. Uh, president Holland graduated uh, with his bachelor's degree from Brigham Young University. He then went on to receive a uh, master's and PhD in uh, political science and early American political philosophy from Duke University. He then uh, received, I believe, a one-year, see, now I've got him right in front of me and I'm going to be all <laughs> nervous, but he was a one-year postdoc, was at Princeton, president. Uh, he worked at Monitor Group, a uh, world-renowned uh, consulting firm in the East Coast. He also received the Raul Wallenberg Fellowship um, and uh, I believe rec also received a fellowship to uh, the University of Jerusalem. Hebrew University. Hebrew University of Jerusalem. All right. If I don't have a job after this, it's Kirk's <laughs> fault uh, for having me do this introduction. Um, on, I can speak uh, uh, with confidence that on behalf of the rest of the cabinet and the rest of the university leadership, uh, it has been inspiring to watch President Holland uh, take the helm here at Utah Valley University uh, with, uh, with this young university and uh, working closely with him. It's been fun to watch him uh, not only publicly um, uh, demonstrate leadership, but also, again, within the, the private offices there uh, of the administrative suite, uh, have him demonstrate leadership. So I'll present to you President Matthew S. Holland. Thank you, Kyle. Can you guys hear me okay? Uh, well, uh, there's a famous management book out there right now called From Good to Great by Jim Collins. And uh, the key insight of that book is that the great uh, key of leadership uh, for any organization is getting the right people on the right seat in the bus. And uh, to the extent I've succeeded as a leader, here, it's in no small part because one of my first moves was to get Kyle Reyes seated on the bus right next to me. So uh, he's, uh, he's been a huge uh, asset. You could learn a lot from uh, having a conversation with him and about his career and education and leadership. And he studies it now at the U of U. So when I'm done, he can stay with him afterwards. He can tell you all the stuff that was right and wrong that I said here. Uh, but uh, it's great uh, to be with you today. Uh, we ready for school? Are you feeling it? I love the baby blue leisure suit. That's very nice, with matching shoes and all. I mean, I'm, I've got to go get a new item for my wardrobe. That's, uh, okay. Uh, uh, well, uh, I had a great holiday break, um, although I fear my family's growing up. We're kind of moving out of that golden age of Christmas. My youngest son, uh, in a conversation with my mother-in-law, his grandmother, she made some reference to Santa. He said, I know who Santa is. She said, oh, really? He said, yeah, it's my dad. She said, oh, really? Yeah, but I go along with it because I get more toys that way. <laughs> so uh, anyway, a little uh, note of melancholy in the Holland home as our kids are figuring out all these great secrets. But uh, uh, coming to UVU for me feels like uh, I don't know what I did to go along with it, but there are just more toys in my life because I get to be at this great university with you terrific students, and it's just the best job. I think I have the best job in the state of Utah, and it's because of you guys. And so it's really an honor for me to be here with you today. And I'm going to do something different. I don't know. Has anyone been to one of these where I've spoken before, just out of curiosity? So, okay. So, uh, as you know from that, uh, I've done this twice now. I've always tried to uh, capitalize on some of my own scholarly expertise. And so, when I was at places like Duke and Princeton and BYU and the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, I studied leadership and especially the leadership of the kind of the early American founding period. And I think there are lots of lessons about politics and government and leadership from that generation. And so for a long time, I would just plan to dedicate my life to the study of that. And I've had to kind of veer off from that now in order to do uh, my work here. Uh, 
but I'm, I am trying to uh, benefit from that, learn those lessons, and, and, and pass them on, because I think there are great lessons to be learned. But uh, what I thought I'd do today is something a little bit different, and that is uh, I wanted to step you through what I went through when I came here as a new president. And I really learned a lot in just these last couple of years because I, I came into it, again, I'd studied leadership and I'd worked for a consulting firm where we advised CEOs. And so I kind of had some ideas about uh, what to do, but I have to confess that a lot of it I've just learned on the job. And so I've tried, what I'm gonna do now is go back and recreate for you what I faced and, and the thoughts that I had going into it, and then how I responded to those thoughts and how it's translated into decisions that I've made, statements that we've put forward, initiatives that the university's moving on. And then uh, I'll open it up for some Q&A for you guys to ask questions about my experience. So uh, again, this isn't meant to be some universal recipe for leadership success. I don't believe in such things. I think there are a handful of concepts and ideas you can have at your disposal, but a lot of it has to get worked out into the concrete reality of the world in which you live. And so, thus, the, the first word here of the, of the uh, lecture. I want to talk about the vision thing. When I was about your age, George Bush, uh, George uh, W. Bush's father, uh, lost his uh, re-election for a president. And uh, in no small part, it was because, uh, as he self-admitted, he said, I'm not very good at the vision thing. He was actually, if you want my opinion, a pretty good president, uh, an underappreciated president in many respects. But he wasn't that great at, as he admitted, about doing the vision thing, articulating a path, setting out a vision, uh, uh, inspiring people to, to move towards that. And so, um, I, I think vision is vital to leadership, and I'm also convinced that it's an art rather than a science. A lot of people would try to make it a science and say there are these, these hard set ideas about how you develop vision. Uh, it's not the way I see it, it's not the way it's worked for me. I believe there's kind of an artistry to it. You have to kind of go by feel and sense and, and instinct uh, depending on the situation that you're facing. And I'll try to bring that out in the presentation uh, right here about how that played out uh, uh, at UVU. So uh, let, let me start with a couple of basic uh, conceptual ideas. There's a lot more we could say about vision, but uh, with respect to vision, what is it that an institution needs? And I would suggest there are kind of two things that are really tied to articulating and setting a vision that an institution needs. The first one is that it needs some aim or some purpose. Uh, in the Bible it says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no direction, where there is no kind of common goal, it's just not a very inspiring place to be. Purpose or aim, even if you don't fully agree with it, can give direction, it can give energy, it gives focus. And so I do think any, any, anything that you're a family, a school, a company, a club, you know, there's room for leadership everywhere. You need an aim. You need to be headed some particular direction. And again, you don't have to stay with that aim forever, and it doesn't have to explain everything that you'll do. But without that, entities, organizations tend to be a little more lifeless. Well, this aim, if it's really going to, if you're going to get there, and if it's really going to be an inspiring aim, ideally that aim is grounded in certain values. There are reasons for this aim, and those aim, and the, and those, that aim is grounded in values. And those values can differ, and they probably should differ across organizations. So. Uh, one value for uh, you know, a, a, a private company or business ought to be the value of getting rich, making money. Uh, if, that's, uh, if that's not a value, then your business is probably not going to do very well, just to put it candidly. Now, that may, that's probably not such a great value for a school. At least that's my own view, that for-profit uh, uh, entities, uh, they start to compromise in some ways what you want to do as a school. So, 
There, again, there's not some universal set of values, but you need to think about your organization, your entity, what are the values that you aspire to, what are the things that you want to cultivate and inculcate, um, and then have that be connected to your aim, and then that really starts to set the vision. But there's another key question in all that is, well, how do you develop these? How do you develop an aim? How do you know what the aim should be? And uh, what about these values? How do you know what an institution's values are or should be? And uh, so here you want to talk about process. You need to think through some process that's going to develop and articulate that aim and those values. And the process will really probably have two components to it. One is there's some process of discovery. Now, why do I say discovery? Because any organization is going to have values associated whether they know it or not, okay? They'll have values associated whether they know it or not because people have values. And so if nothing else, if you just surveyed the people in your company or your school or your family or on your team, there's going to be a set of values that will emerge as dominant or majoritarian. So part of it is we just need to see what are the values that we have. Uh, the other uh, tougher thing, though, is to say, well, yeah, maybe we have these values or maybe we have this aim, but maybe they're not the right values or maybe it's not the right aim. And so now we need a process not just of discovering what our values are, we need a process to think about how we change those values and how we change that aim so that we're headed in the right direction and doing with all, having all the energy that we need, okay? So those are just, I think, that's all I'm going to say about a, a general construct for, uh, for vision setting. Now the, the rest are things that I want to talk about uh, as, as you come into a situation you may face, questions you'll ask yourself, issues that you might need to uh, wrestle with too and all th through the things that I talked about. Any, lead, any leader um, I think f will face some te what I call leadership tensions uh, when, they, when they're trying to lead. And uh, I've taken this, you're getting this from the, you're listening to a political scientist. So if you were to hear a, a, someone from uh, the business field or organizational psychology, they'd probably use different terms. But I'm going to use the terms of political philosophy and political science, which is also about leadership. But I think it applies across uh, institutions. One is to say uh, you could do things democratically as a leader. You could stand up and say, okay, uh, going to bring a little order here. We need to make up some decisions. What are our values? What's our aim? Uh, let's have a vote about it. We can all talk about it. We can make some speeches. And then at the end of the day, let's just kind of vote and go with uh, what, the, what the majority thinks. The other, this is, uh, as I draw this from a, a, the, the first book of all great political philosophy, Plato's Republic, and Plato goes through the different regimes that you can have. So on one end is democracy. On the other end, and there's a whole bunch in between, it's the rule by the philosopher king. Okay? This is the um, inspired, brilliant, charismatic, strong individual leader who steps up and says, Okay, here's the answer, and here's some inspirational vision, and here's some energy, and here's some key decisions, and uh, I'm going to make this happen. Okay? Let's have a discussion here for just a minute. We'll kind of turn this into a bit of a classroom experience. What do you see as the pluses or minuses about either of those? Are there things that you would say are good about one versus the other? What would you, what, what yeah. Okay. Okay. So the philosopher king is decisive, uh, done more quickly. Yes. Um, well, with, the, uh, with democracy, it's going to be a little bit more like seen, like pleasing to all the people. Um, like in the first part, the it's kind of like how no <coughs> like he did stuff that like the people didn't like, but he knew it was like the right thing to do. So he was like the good initiative, the initiative in his favor. So. Okay. So democracy may may be pleasing to more people, but the philosopher king. Uh, you know, may be needed to actually get something done. Yeah. With democracy, it'll be harder to institute that change you're talking about because you're basing your change and your decisions off of what the republic wants, not necessarily what the best 
Okay, all right. Yeah. Um, with the philosopher C um, idea that it's only it's a lot more of one person making the choices. I guess you said in some sense that like you know people in the organization feel that they didn't have a say in the in the minority of Okay, good. So we've had a lot of first from the first comments kind of tilting towards the philosopher king, but there may be some challenges there if people feel disenfranchised if the philosopher king just kind of makes all the decisions themselves. Uh, any other comments about it? One, one more, yeah. Philosopher king is uh, only operating from one viewpoint. With democracy, you get so many perspectives and ideas. Yeah, OK. So, one, so again, that's a, so a nice little discussion. Some real pluses and minuses uh, to, to both. I just kind of cast this in, the, in more of the negative. Um, some of the challenges with democracy is that it's kind of anarchic, okay? It's just, if it's truly everybody, you know, has an equal say, uh, you know, uh, it just is not very efficient. It's hard to get stuff done uh, because no one's in charge, really. Uh, on the other hand, the philosopher king, that can tend towards a dictatorship, uh, which, uh, to my mind, is, you know, it's not anarchic, but it's immoral. Uh, to say nothing of how it may be depressing to people because they're not involved in the process. And so I think what any leader needs to do when they come into a setting is to say, okay, these are the two extremes and I probably, unless I'm just, you know, uh, some, uh, you know, all-seeing, all-powerful, prophetic uh, person, I've not met a lot of those in my life, uh, I probably am not going to do this. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I am a leader. I've been asked to lead. I'm not just to stand up there and be a poll taker. So I probably need to draw the line somewhere in between there. And again, this speaks to kind of the art of leadership and vision. Maybe, you know, in a certain setting, you'll need to be a little closer to, towards democracy. Maybe in another setting, a little closer to philosopher king. Um, just, uh, you know, by way of example, uh, in a business uh, where you've got to really move fast, and in some businesses you have to move extra fast, uh, you know, having something where there's a more decisive leader figure who can really get things done and make it work and they know the industry, well, then maybe you trend a little bit here. Frankly, working in an educational setting, like what I was coming into here at UVU, you've got faculty, they think they have a say in all of this. You've got fellow administrators. They think they've got a say in all this. At the end of the day, we're here for your, you students. You should have a say in all of this. And for someone just to come in and say, OK, that's it. I'm, I'm doing it this way. Uh, a lot of university leaders have lost their jobs because they've tried to do too much of this and not enough of that. So uh, anyway, you just got to make those kind of judgments about uh, what you're facing. Another tension that I think leaders face uh, is uh, as you come into a, um, a, a new opportunity to lead, is to uh, unless you're unless you're just unless you're really not a leader, you're an entrepreneur and you're starting something entirely new. You're stepping into something where there has been a leader, and this is a this is an interesting and important question, an issue, and one that I think too many leaders don't pay enough attention to. But it is to say, well, what do we do about the past versus the future? And so that's the tension that we face here, which is, uh, do we just continue on with what's been done in the past, or do we look to the future? So you were so brilliant last time. Let's have another little discussion about that. What's the, what's the pluses and minuses of kind of going with the past versus being focused on the future and developing something new. Yeah. I think having learned from the past. Okay. It's like you're looking at that and you're looking at something that you haven't Okay, so the past comes with a certain kind of wisdom and that we shouldn't ignore. Yeah. If you're always stuck in the past, then you can never make a decision that works for yourself. Okay. So the world we live in tends to be dynamic and changing and and what worked in the past just because it worked is no guarantee that may work in the future. We need to be open to that. Yes? Those who fail to learn history are doomed to repeat it. Okay. 
All right, so again, they're, they're typically organizations do things for a certain reason because they've had an experience. They, they ran into this issue. They experienced this problem. And they've addressed that and designed something in response to it. You just throw, you want to just throw that all out, uh, the baby out with the bathwater? Yeah. How can any situation from the past not exactly match what you're dealing with in the future? And so how do we just keep the future in our solutions? Yeah. So that's a kind of a, that's kind of a counter statement to the one that was just offered, which again, I haven't disputed. I think there's wisdom in that about those who don't learn history are doomed to repeat it. There's a, this kind of old Chinese proverb, though, about a man can never step into a river twice. You know, that river, it's the same river, more or less, but you step through it, you come back out, you step through it again, it's a new river. Uh, life is dynamic, it's flowing. Uh, yeah. Good, okay, yeah. So I think like the best thing for the past, it's, it's good to look back and see, the best thing for the future is to look in the past to see what strategies were the best, what things were most successful, but dwelling on the negative, I don't think is right, because you should be dwelling on the positive. So dwelling on the positive of each end brings more success to the future. Okay, yeah. Yeah, okay. One more comment. Yeah, I think it's like, it's all, it is really important to like look into the past and to dwell on it and everything like that, but um, it's also important to like um, be able to change things. Like if you're so used to doing one thing all the time and you don't like, if you like expand things and try to um, try new things, then you're never going to really improve the whole look in the past. So. Okay, good. Well, again, you could have a very rich discussion. Uh, here, uh, kind of a, a blend of positive and negatives. The past. Uh, it brings wisdom. Uh, you, you, you do, look, you're talking to a political scientist slash historian. We have to understand the past. Uh, if we don't, uh, we're going to make some profound mistakes and misunderstandings. But the past is static. The past addressed the past. And you live in the now. You live in the future. Uh, um, Soren Kierkegaard, I think, put it best when he said, uh, life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. So you have to understand the past, but then you have to be open to the future. The future is dynamic. Uh, you overcome that staticness, if you will. Uh, but if you're only focused on the future and that dynamism, then you're kind of unanchored from the truths, the wisdom, the insights you might have gleaned from the past. And so once again, You've got to, again, there's no, there's no magical formula that tells you exactly what you should do in whatever situation you're in. You're going to have to kind of sort that through for yourself. And again, it will, it will determine, you know, what, what you're doing. If you're, you know, if you're working for Apple, uh, to use this example, uh, which has kind of defined itself by developing the next new thing, uh, the new IT product, you're going to have to be pretty focused on the future. You know, if you're a bank, uh, we got a lot of banks that got in trouble because they got caught up with this new thing called derivatives that people didn't really know about. And it seemed to make a lot of money. But it defied all of the conventional wisdom about banking. And there were a lot of people who lost a lot of money and very uh, important folks who lost their jobs because they didn't stick to that wisdom of the past. So, again, you've got to figure out where your organization is on that continuum and, and then uh, act accordingly. Well, so these were certainly things I was facing as I came in, again, on the education front. My sense was that the past at UVU had been very, it, it was a great past. We had 
we had grown so rapidly from a technical college into a community college, from a state college into a university, that there was a lot to be learned from that. And all of that happened before I ever walked in the door. So who was I to walk in and say, OK, now I'm really going to tell you how things should work. I thought that would have been a great mistake on my part. And yet, I also came in believing that the regents had kind of taken a gamble on a little younger person who had some outside experience, who might come in with a fresh perspective, and that I wasn't brought on board just to be some caretaker of a past vision, that I was expected to put you know, a kind of a stamp on things and move things forward. So I was really, I think, kind of trying to strike it right down the middle for this institution at this time. So that's some of the thinking that I did as I came into it. So now, um, uh, the other thing that you've got to do is, again, in this idea of it being an art, is uh, figure out what does, what, what is the kind of state of vision, if you will, when you come into an institution, all right, or, a, or an organization. And my experience uh, had been uh, primarily when I'd worked as a consultant uh, with this group that Kyle mentioned, Monitor Group. I'd worked with a couple of companies. I'd worked with a state government. Uh, I had taken the things I'd learned there and applied it to uh, some uh, different uh, private groups. And my experience had overwhelmingly been that institutions did not have a vision. They were just, I mean, they, they, they kind of, they were working because they had some product or because they had some responsibility like you are the state government and make state government work. But they didn't really have a very articulate, thoughtful vision. And so the job was to draw it out, interview people and assemble some ideals and package it up and say, you know, here, how about this? You know, here's what I see as a possible vision for you folks and kind of create one from scratch. And there's a process, and if you want some time, I could come back and talk to you about that process that I worked through. And frankly, that was sort of what I was expecting to do, that I would come here and I would kind of follow this little template that I'd used successfully in other professional settings, and I'd build up this new vision for UVU. But then I got here, and sort of to my alarm, I found out that UVU had the opposite problem. They didn't lack for vision. We were knee deep in vision. We had vision all over the place. We had vision coming out the doors, out the windows. Um, let me just give you an example. We had a mission statement. There was vision in there. We had a, a role statement. There was vision all over in that. We had a value statement. Uh, here, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, I'm in some death loop here, Kyle. Yeah. Uh, I'm just hitting the back button. But yeah. See? Okay. There, thank you. Worth his weight in gold. Okay. Uh, we had a 2009 strategic direction statement. We had an, uh, an engagement model statement. We had a 2018 guiding concept statement. We had goals set for us by the system of higher education. We had to develop core themes for accreditation. And we we're thinking about a capital campaign that would have a case statement. Every one of those was at least a, you know, kind of a paragraph, if not a page, of vision. We had a, you know, uh, 5,000 pages of vision at UVU. So I kind of saw this, and it was making my head spin. I'd never experienced this before. What am I supposed to do with this? And the problem was is that I had some of my own ideas. Um, so, uh, wow, uh, okay. Anyway, I was just gonna give you some examples of what the mission statement is. That was our role statement, quality academic learning, access to higher education, economic cultural development. We had our core values, learning and scholarship, freedom, ethics and integrity, engaged learning diversity. Uh, we had our engagement model. We were to be people of integrity, professionally competent stewards of place. Uh, we had our Yushi goals. We were to be committed to participation, completion, economic impact. And that's just, you know, a third of them or a fourth of them, okay? Imagine trying to manage all of that. And then old Holland shows up 
And I throw out some new things for us, because uh, I'm sort of a masochist. Uh, so um, uh, I, I, I started talking about four different words that seem to me to capture UVU. Now, I will say that these words didn't just come out of the blue. They came after extensive uh, interviews and talking to people and thinking about things. And one of the leadership practices that I've found very useful is making good friends with the yellow pad. I've got dozens of these in my files that are just filled with notes I took talking from people about the university, where it was, where it was headed, where they thought it ought to go. I talked to people on campus, I talked to people off campus, and I took all that and these were some things that came through. So now I've got my adjectives I've thrown onto this mix of everything else and what are you going to do with all of that? Well, uh, we held a, a presidential cabinet uh, retreat and uh, one of the things you always want to do as a leader is continue to connect people emotionally to the institution, what they're doing. We had people share stories about, you know, how they got to UVU, and it was very meaningful, and, and it, I think it really brought a, a good energy and electricity uh, to the room. And then I did something cheeky. I gave a quiz. You know, I'm the new kid on the block. I'm, you know, uh, probably younger than most of the people in the room. And uh, to the deans and the vice presidents, I gave them a quiz on those documents. What do you remember about the mission statement? What do you remember about the guiding concept statement? What do you remember about this? They could get about 20% of the material right. And these are the leaders. So what, what does that tell you? If that's what the leaders know, what do the rank and file know? Yeah, something less than that, okay? So I was convinced we had this problem of too much vision on our hands. And so the goal was not to build up a new vision, but was to take what we had and kind of boil it down into something more simple. And then, but do it in a way that honored the past while still moved us forward to the future. And so uh, I called this act an act of synthesis. How do we synthesize these different parts of vision and have it speak to the past as well as to the future? And this is what I presented to the leadership retreat. I said, let me try something on you. I've, I've put out these four words, serious, engaged, inclusive. These are the, the things that, uh, that we were championing. Large was the, was the fourth one. Let me show you how I think these words uh, connect with things that you've already said are important to you. So we took the mission statement and um, kind of boiled it down to uh, one, one idea, student success, okay? Uh, and said, let's put that at the heart of what we're talking about. Okay, that's the kind of the core concept of your core mission statement, uh, student success. Then let's take these other themes, in inclusive, engaged, serious, and large, and see how we might uh, apply apply them. Large is going to go off the screen here for a little bit because there are a lot of people who didn't like the use of that word and as I kind of rolled it out they didn't like it and so I had to think about it. Uh, but people kind of liked those words and then said okay what if we think about those three things serious, engaged, inclusive as forming the core of our mission around this ultimate aim of we're here for students and student success. And then I took them back through each of the documents that I showed you. I'm going to move through this pretty, pretty fast uh, and, and show how they each fit in one of these areas. Large then kind of turned into this. Uh, any group uh, administrative imperatives. If we're going to be large, we've got to get the resources to supply it. We've got to manage the growth of becoming large and we have to operate effectively. So. You take our mission statement, and again, uh, if you guys want, uh, we'll, we'll work with Kirk to get you access to these slides if you really want to burrow into it. But I went through the whole mission, I went through every document and could show them where key elements of the, of the statement would fit into some part of this, this model of integration. So 
you look at the things that are highlighted and how they move. Uh, if we're going to be a serious academic institution, we're going to be serious about teaching. That's what a serious university does. Uh, if we're going to be inclusive, we provide opportunity for students from a wide range of backgrounds. Uh, if we're going to be engaged, we're listening to the needs of the community around us. Uh, scholarly and creative work. Again, that's what universities do, is they encourage students and faculty to, to do research and to write and to create and publish and perform. Uh, engaged learning, again, that's a, just a synonym for that whole concept of engaged. Lifelong learners, if a serious university fosters students who are lifelong, lifelong learners. Uh, leadership development, we're, again, it's not just that we're off in the ivory tower, we're developing leaders, we're becoming leaders because we're engaged with the world around us that has problems that need addressing. Uh, globally interdependent, we're inclusive, we're reaching out across the world. Uh, that, uh, you know, here at the end, all of that about what we're preparing. Student success, this defines student success for it. Professionally competent, people of integrity, stewards of a place. So I did that for all of these different documents, okay? We don't need to take time to go through. But by the time we were done, you could see that we had taken all of these different documents and shown how they could be boiled down into four simple phrases. UVU is going to be serious. We're going to be a high-quality uh, institution of uh, advanced learning. And that's, going to, that's a core component of what we aspire to be. We're going to be engaged with the world around us. We're going to bring people onto our campus. We're going to send our campus out into the world. We're going to address real-world problems and issues. We're going to be inclusive. This is an institution for the rich and the poor, the liberal and the conservative, the white and the black, the male and the female, uh, the well-prepared and the underprepared. That's our mission, okay? Other missions, other schools would, would go one direction or the other. There'd be a community college and say, we're really just for the kind of uh, underprepared, the lower division student. Others would say, we're an elitist. We're going to be hyper-selective. Only the, you know, the folks who blasted the ACT out of the water and have a 4.0 are here. We're going to be, we're defining ourselves as being open and inclusive across a range of different preparations. And all of that is focused on this main aim of student success. That's why we're here. We're here, here to help you guys. We're here to help you be professionally competent, graduate, you've seen our billboards, graduate with a diploma and a resume. We're here to help you succeed academically, learn how to be uh, a, a lifelong learner, people of integrity that you come out with some ethical training, and you're responsible, stewards of place. You're engaged with the world around you. Now, uh, in contrast, I have to say, to this quiz that I gave the leaders when I first came in, where they could remember about 20%, I think you could go to almost any faculty member, and certainly any leader, any dean, associate vice president, vice president, and they can whittle off those four phrases. When they say, what's UVU about, about, they will give you those four phrases. They'll say, we're serious, we're engaged, we're inclusive, and we're focused on student success. Now we have a vision that we can remember that's inspiring, that, by, that you know, shows, uh, buys into the past, but it's a, it's, a new, it's a little new language, and there's some new concepts, and it's adapted for our time. Uh, and, and so we move forward. Now, the large thing, that's a little more tricky. I'm not sure how many, how this is on the tip of people's tongues, but for our planning purposes, when we get with uh, our admin administrators and deans and vice presidents, they all know that when they propose a budget, they've got to propose some things that will promote student success, help us be more engaged, help us get better academically, help us be inclusive culturally and academically, but they also know to do that, we've got to figure out how to get resources, how to be a better fundraising institution, how to get more tax monies, how to manage growth, and how to, how to operate effectively. So again, that rolls off their, their tongue, so to speak. 
This they can remember when they stop and think about it. But that's the vision. And it's not like we've thrown away all those other documents. We still sometimes refer to them and, you know, pull up a phrase here and there to emphasize what we're doing. But mostly what we've got now is this, is this shorthand for a vision that, that, again, pays homage to the past, but points us towards the future, and that people feel like they had buy-in to. This wasn't just me coming in the very first day and announcing it. This was me listening to a lot of people and then proposing some words and then letting people respond to those words and then showing them the connections and then bringing this together in a model that people agreed to. So I'm going to move through that. Uh, we don't need to spend much time on that. So do you see what we did then? We synthesized those 10 different documents, all of those aspirations, into this story, a, a short, compelling story about who UVU is. This is, and this is who we are. And then we turn that into driving the actions, the things that we would do. How, what kind of resources will we need to do to make that happen? How will we manage growth? And then asked each of the divisions, presidential, divisional, and individual, set some priorities based on these things. That's the other thing you've got to do. It's not enough just to have a vision. Then you've got to get the institution to do their planning according to that vision. And so I'll just show you. I took my yellow pad and I had scores of goals that I, I wanted to achieve when I came in. Things I thought this would be great to do, that would be great to do. After I went, we went through that exercise, I went back through and put all of the goals under those headings. Serious, engaged, inclusive, okay, and then those administrative imperatives operate effectively, secure resources, manage growth. So you start to show, I was trying to lead by example, saying, okay, these are our values. Here are the things I would like to do to try to push for the institution under each of those headings. Okay? What's wrong with that list? Anyone? Don't be afraid to be critical. It's too long. Thank you. Uh, that is way too much for uh, a new leader to come in and try to accomplish uh, right off the bat. But what this did help me is give me the sense, okay, here are the different areas. I had this long, indiscriminate list of things I thought I needed to do. Now I had a way to channel them under the things that we were collectively agreed were most central. And then once I was able to look at that list, I was able to say, okay, Within that list, assuming that we want to make progress on each of those things, what's the most important thing I could do under each of those headings? And those will be my top presidential priorities. And it was at least one, sometimes two, but it helped me come up with this list. Uh, a science building. Uh, this was on the serious list. It was on the, also the help manage growth list. Uh, and it came up in a number of different places. This, I thought, was the most important thing that we could do to move the university forward. We were running out of space. The laboratories on campus were pathetic. It was limiting our ability to, to deliver a high quality, serious education in science. So this was one goal that would simultaneously help a number of those core themes. Uh, academic governance, uh, again, uh, one that appeared under serious. We've got to make this place a more serious academic place and operate effectively. We've got to have clear, coherent policies. Uh, strategic plan for growth, that came under inclusive. If we're going to still have these big open doors that lets everybody in, we've got a plan for that growth. And we've got to, uh, again, uh, the administrative imperatives call for that. Leadership of regional economic development. A lot of ways that we could engage the community. Uh, and it seemed to me the first place to start was with the business community. They have money, they've got expertise, they want to invest in us, we ought to start there. It's not the only place, but we would start by helping uh, with economic development in the region. Um, to secure more resources, we had to fix some challenges, organizational challenges in the development office. Uh, inclusive, 
three particular uh, initiatives under, under there uh, that uh, Kyle's given some great uh, leadership on. Uh, student, wellness, uh, student Life and Wellness Center. If we're serious about student life and student success, what can we do here to create on campus a better environment for students, to give you more recreational opportunities, more health opportunities, uh, all the things that we're going to put in this exciting new Student Life and Wellness Center that we're getting. And then finally, if we're serious about education, teaching students that I would lead by example and become the chief student cheerleader and teach a class. And I didn't end up doing that, but I did end up guest lecturing a number of times that semester and have always tried to be in, involved with the students. I love working with you guys, being with you guys, going to lunch in the Valley View room, out in the halls when the class starts uh, for the first day of the semester, uh, going to the basketball games. Uh, it would be easy not to do those things. I certainly have a lot of other things honking at me, but I love doing it and I want to make it prime because that's at the core of our mission is student success. So this was a way of focusing my presidential priorities uh, coming into it. And so I asked then the vice presidents and the deans and the associate vice presidents, you go make your list. I need you to support my initiatives. Now what are your initiatives? What will you do to make this place more serious, more inclusive, more engaged, more focused on student success? and then ask them to report back to me. I want to see what your goals are. I want to know a timetable. I want commitments about what you're going to accomplish. And that's how we do our planning every year now. I sit down with my vice presidents, and they show me in these categories the things they're going to try to accomplish uh, in, those, in each of those areas. And so that was the way uh, we brought forward uh, that vision. So. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's a big job, uh, and again, you have to learn a lot on the fly, and I, I say that because that was my experience, but that's going to be your experience, too, anytime you go into uh, a leadership moment like that. Well, there's a lot more that we could say about this, uh, but uh, I, just, I do want to note that it, it, it's been a very uh, exhilarating experience for me to be part of this, and I've learned a lot myself in doing that. So. Uh, before I wrap up, wrap up, let me stop here and just say uh, I'll, I've got time for maybe one or two questions and then I've got uh, six legislators waiting in the other room for me so I can go tell them that we need more money. So, uh, <laughs> so any, any questions? Yeah. 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 It's a good, good question. Uh, uh, Kyle can probably answer better than, uh, than I can. He's got a better memory than I do. But uh, Kyle, I, I've got a staff, a, a presidential staff, and um, Kyle's part of that. Linda Macon, my chief planning and budget officer, is part of that. Uh, we started to talk about it. I, I, you know, first of all, it took me a few weeks. You know, I came in. I didn't just rush right off, uh, and when I could sense there was a problem, I just started to ask questions like, you got this document and that document, and what does it mean? And when I could start to sense that these weren't really that, you know, being that useful, um, I started to talk with Kyle and Linda. And, and then we also, it, it, there's is a, it speaks to the importance of counsel. So they were very helpful, but we recognized we needed even additional help. And I'd gotten friendly with a guy named Dave Ulrich. And he's like one of the top management consultants in the world right now. And he lives in Utah Valley. And he had offered to be of help. And I just said, would you spend an afternoon with us? And so we sat down, the four of us, and started to, I had this hunch that this would work. And I kind of I kind of threw it out to them. And they bounced ideas back and forth. And so it was really probably about a two-month process of, you know, you know, three or four meetings with this group, and a lot of time on my own, and a lot of midnight oil burned by Kyle, uh, kind of pulling this uh, presentation together. So you're absolutely right and astute that what you see, what, you know, what the folks saw presented at the leadership retreat may have just appeared to them, but there was a lot of legwork that was done in advance. And that's the other key lesson for leadership is you got to do your homework. If you're going to be prepared, 
You're going to be able to answer. You're going to be able to defend. You're going to be able to argue. It's because you've really kind of thought through those things and you have answers for people. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, you know, for right now, we've just decided to let the private market take care of the housing issue. Uh, and so far, that's worked. You know, most of the students, uh, we could take a little poll here, most of you are commuters. Uh, so we don't have quite the same on-campus demands uh, that BYU does, where so many students come from out of state. So uh, right now, uh, again, we have the doors open, and the students keep coming, and they either find apartments or stay at home. And that seems to be working. I do think we're getting to that point now where either the market's going to have to respond and more apartment complexes will be built, or we'll find that you know, we get overwhelmed and students peel off and then growth does go down, and we'll realize we've hit our limit. But right now, we seem to be able to move forward uh, on that front. So, uh, another question or two about uh, uh, leadership, what we went through? Yeah. Well, the key thing is just to, uh, and, uh, and I think this is a good leadership principle in general, is just make sure you, you stick with it. So often leaders, you know, when they set a vision or they do a strategic study or whatnot, they spend a lot of time and effort and they do this study and they have this document and then it just sits on a shelf. You've got to integrate it into your daily activities. And the way that we've done it is that we've made it part of our planning budget and accountability process. I didn't go through that with you. But all of us, president, vice presidents, the deans, the associate vice presidents, when they come in the fall to present to me, basically, their request for money, they have to do it through these themes. They have to show me, how is this going to make us more serious? How will this make us more engaged? How will this make us more inclusive? And nothing focuses an organization's mind like tying it to the budget. Uh, and so uh, by doing that, you keep it fresh and live. and then. And then we just refine that as we go. And we learn, OK, we're getting a lot of push in this area, but not enough in here. We need to bump that up. Or we've learned this really isn't catching, so we need to adjust that. But you've got to do something that puts it into the everyday activity of the organization, or, or it won't be, won't be useful and it won't be adaptable. So. Uh, last question, then I got a scoop. Mm -hmm. uh, some, so you know, again, it kind of went incrementally. Like my first laid out the four, the four themes in a university address long before the leadership retreat, and and then I asked for feedback on that, and that's where I discovered everyone was choking on this term large. So as you saw, the whole the term large went away entirely. It wasn't a term that worked for this institution. I thought it was true, and I keep reminding people. Uh, as we go forward, how many times they'll bring an issue to me. I'll say, that's because we're large, isn't it? And they'll go, yeah, you're right. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, they didn't like it. It wasn't inspiring. And it really didn't kind of fit with the other people. And that whole idea of putting student success at the center, that worked much better. So uh, you just kind of take it segment by segment, and you respond to it, and you adjust a as needs be. And again, what I've showed you really that, that whole process took about 18 months. You got a kind of a collapsed version of it. And it was a lot of dialogue back and forth. And you have to solicit feedback, and you actually have to read it and respond to it. And it's amazing how much credit you'll get as a leader if you just stand up and say, yeah, you know, I read this memo by one of you, and you had a good point. And so we're going to go a little different direction. They're going, oh, wow, yeah, you guy's a rocket scientist. Not really. I just listened. You know, okay. uh, anything else? I got to scoot. I love you. You're the best. You're the greatest. You make this the best job in the world. So keep it up. Right. And apparently, I have to leave the microphone here. So. Okay.